And good evening to folks coming in. We're just going to wait a few more minutes as uh, folks continue to come in and we'll get started in just about 60 seconds. Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks very much for joining us. My name is Denise Vigno, and I want to welcome you to Howard Center's Myrna and Stephen Wise Tulin Community Education Series. Tonight's our second of three sessions this spring, and we are so pleased to have Dr. John Brooklyn with us to talk about alcohol use and why we should be talking about it. Uh, just looking ahead, our third and final session is on April 6 with community support approaches to hoarding and clutter. And then, of course, our annual conference is coming up on March 30th. Information for both of these upcoming events is online at howardcenter.org. We want to thank our partner and our friends at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont for their support for our spring series. And tonight, uh, what we're going to be doing is after Dr. Brooklyn's remarks, he'll take questions which may be sent through the Q&A at any time throughout the session. Many of you have been uh, to our sessions previously. And um, you will find the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You may ask questions anonymously all throughout and after Dr. Uh, Brooklyn finishes his remarks. During the webinar, your audio, video, and chat functions will not be available. Uh, we will be recording the session, so it will be posted in the coming days on our website at howardcenter.org. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Brooklyn, who gave a talk at our first community education session back in the fall of 2015, and we're really delighted to have him back tonight. Dr. Brooklyn, always an inspiring speaker, is frequently invited to speak around the country and beyond. And my, he has a long list of personal and professional accomplishments. He is board certified in family medicine and addiction medicine, is an associate clinical professor on the University of Vermont Family Medicine and Psych Psychiatry faculty, and is the physician expert in the UVM Center on Rural Addiction. He's the medical director of our own Howard Center Chittenden Clinic Hub and the Baymark St. Albans Hub. He also continues as a family physician at Community Health Centers of Burlington. I'm not sure where he finds the time for his many commitments, but he's been, has been, and continues to be a very strong advocate for people with substance use disorders. Dr. Brooklyn conceived of the internationally recognized Vermont hub and spoke model for treatment of opioid use disorders and helped create CHARM, a nationally recognized model to, to treat pregnant opioid users and their children. He's a national mentor for substance use disorder treatment and a trainer for students, residents, and faculty members throughout the US. He's, he is using technological solutions to increase access to opioid agonist treatment and directs the telehealth, the telemonitoring project at the Chittenden Clinic. His interests remain primary care, the interface of behavior and health, promotion of healthy lifestyles, preventative care, treatment of substance use disorders, mindfulness, and motivational interviewing. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. John Brooklyn. Thank you, Denise. Uh, I have to say this is my first foray in doing a uh, virtual talk without seeing anybody's response to know if you're awake, asleep, or throwing tomatoes at me. So I will take it on faith that 
um, everybody's with me through this. Um, and I'd like to start to share my screen if I could figure out exactly how to do it. Excellent. So um, Denise, can you just tell me if you can hear me okay? Perfect, John. Okay, great. Thank you. So I, I'm hoping today to cover three areas. One is what is alcohol? Um, what are the effects on our bodies? And what should we do about it if we think that friends or family or ourselves is having difficulty with it? Well, let's see. There we go. I have to move my little widget out of the way. Okay. So as I mentioned, we're going to talk about what is alcohol, how is it produced, <clears throat> what are the effects on the human body, and why should we care? So historically, creatures somehow find their way to beverages or instances where alcohol has been created. Um, we know that for millennium and eons, fruit has fallen off of trees, has rotted and has turned to alcohol through the interaction of microbes. And these creatures have discovered through the um, use of human technology, how to imbibe um, in the drink of alcohol. We also have a very robust history of alcohol use in our society. And uh, we'd like to discuss that for a little bit. So if you look back historically, wine, beer have been produced for probably seven or 8,000 years. There are records back 6,000 BC, wines are produced. And we do know that for many people in the Middle Ages, there was really no viable drinking water. So uh, alcoholic beverages were created because they were safe. They could be made from fruit or grain and people were using them for many, many uh, periods of time. Making ethanol is actually quite simple. So the word ethanol basically means ethyl alcohol and alcohol is distinguished from other kinds of alcohol like rubbing alcohol, which we use in our skin or methanol, which we use in our car as a two carbon um, compound. Now I'm not gonna get too complicated for folks who aren't chemists, but two carbon compounds are readily um, digestible by humans, while a single carbon compound such as methanol or three carbon compounds such as propyl alcohol are toxic to the human body. So when we take any kind of a starch, uh, typically it's a grain or we take a fruit and you extract the sugar from it, you then can apply a fermentation in order to create alcohol and carbon dioxide. In some cases that process will turn to vinegar which is also a two carbon uh, substance, but making alcohol is a very straightforward uh, technique and it all involves the use of yeast. Now, for those of you who are not biologists, yeast and, um, can live in two kinds of environment. One is aerobic, which is the presence of oxygen, in which case the yeast take the sugar and they break it down for energy. Humans do the exact same thing. We take uh, glucose and we break it down and make energy from it. But in an anaerobic environment where there's no oxygen, uh, the yeast will take that uh, sugar and incompletely break it down. And the byproduct that they make is ethanol and carbon dioxide. So in a way, the ethanol is a byproduct of metabolism, but when humans consume it, it causes various reactions to occur. So ethanol in some ways is an incomplete way of yeast breaking down um, sugars in order to utilize for energy. You can see here on the slide just briefly that it's relatively complex. You start with this stuff called pyruvate, which comes from glucose. Glucose can again be obtained from grain or from uh, fruit. And basically the addition of um, uh, enzymes that the yeast have break it down and you create ethanol. So what is a standard drink? I've already gotten a few questions in the box. So essentially when we talk about the consumption of alcohol, we talk about the percentage of pure alcohol, alcohol in a drink. So this is a pretty standard chart. You can see that a 12 ounce beer, which has about 5% ethanol per volume is equal to one and a half ounces 
of a 40% uh, spirit. And essentially, um, it's the same amount of alcohol, it's just in a diluted form. So all of these amounts are essentially equal. So if someone has one beer or one shot or one five ounce glass of wine, you're getting the same amount of alcohol by volume. Now of note, um, we know that uh, people who uh, drink, especially good Vermont beers, know that the alcohol content is considerably higher than 5%, somewhere around 6, 7, 8%. So that would fall into the malt liquor category, meaning that an eight and a half, eight and a half ounce glass of, uh, of a malted beer <clears throat> or malted liquor is closer to a 12 ounce uh, bottle of beer which means that there's 14 grams of pure ethanol, which is essentially half an ounce. So uh, as mentioned here, when you have this one and a half ounces, 40% of that equals 14 grams of ethanol. And we'll come back to that in a little bit when we find out how it's metabolized in the body. So we're gonna review now the pathway of alcohol through the body. We're gonna follow it uh, from the time we ingest it through the time it's metabolized. And we're gonna take a look and see what happens. So clearly we can't talk about alcohol without talking about the brain because the brain is where most of the effects of alcohol are uh, detected. Now, if you look at this slide, you'll see in the center of the brain is a orange uh, area, which is the reward pathway in the brain. So when we begin to consume any substance, whether it be um, alcohol, whether it be nicotine, opiate, cocaine, chocolate, variety of different things, we activate this reward pathway. So we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about why we have the effects that we do when we consume alcohol orally. So I like to think about this um, reward pathway in three parts. One is this area called the ventral tegmental area. Now it's a fancy word, but it's essentially where we release some of the chemicals um, in our brain. Now, just to back up for a minute, in the brain, the brain um, communicates with different cells through the release of chemicals called neurotransmitters. And there are essentially five that are involved in alcohol consumption. And the problem is that they all have competing interests. And if you think about the ventral tegmental area, as the landing strip as an, of an airport, you have all these planes that are trying to land and you have the traffic controller at the center. The traffic controller at the VTA currently is not releasing any chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is the chemical that we release when we are feeling some kind of reward. So anything that we do that causes us to feel good about what we've done, causes the release of dopamine. Drugs release dopamine, alcohol releases dopamine, getting an A on a test, going for a run, a variety of things release dopamine. And that's the reward center. So when we consume alcohol, alcohol causes the release of a variety of different chemicals that all compete at this ventral tegmental area to cause the release of dopamine. So in the uh, concept of, again, of this air traffic controller, we have the initial ingestion of alcohol that gets into our bloodstream and immediately gets to the brain within five minutes. And those of you who's, who've ever consumed alcohol, you know that if you're sitting quietly and you sort of follow the pathway of alcohol through your brain, fairly quickly, you begin to feel a little bit of euphoria and, um, and lightness of being. And that's mainly because of the release of two neurotransmitters, which we'll get to in a moment. And those neurotransmitters, which are called endorphins and serotonin, then cause the release of the dopamine, which makes us feel the pleasure and the reward. However, there are two other competing chemicals in the brain. One is called GABA, which is an inhibitory chemical, and that prevents the release of dopamine. So in order for alcohol to work, alcohol actually inhibits the activity of GABA. And because you suddenly are opening the key, opening the door and allowing the chemicals to flow, you feel euphoria. So the balance of these pleasurable chemicals, endorphins, serotonin, and dopamine being balanced by GABA is a constant battle in the brain and alcohol enhances that so that people feel enjoyment initially when they drink. 
So as I mentioned, within five minutes, you usually get some kind of a relaxed feeling, mainly because of the endorphins and the serotonin, both of which are involved. Now to back up for a moment, the interesting thing about endorphins is that these are opioids. This means internal opiate. And so we know that for many people, when they um, consume alcohol, they release these endorphins, which gives them a good feeling. And there is a cross tolerance for many people between alcohol and opiates, where opiates and alcohol can have a very similar effect on the human brain. But the mechanism of euphoria that occurs from alcohol is the initial release of these endorphins, which make us feel good. We then get the release of dopamine I mentioned, which is the reward. And that helps us by sending, we're back to this picture, sends a signal to that front part called the nucleus accumbens where we begin to store memories. And those memories produce thoughts and uh, ideas up to our thinking part of our brain so that we can replicate the activity that we did. So let's say for the sake of argument, someone gave you a brown liquid in a glass and said, drink this, and you were willing to drink it, you drank it, and you had a, a good feeling about it, you got some euphoria, you felt lightheaded, you would then say, okay, every time someone gives me a glass with this brown liquid in it, and I drink it, I'm going to have that effect. And so that prefrontal cortex begins to have memory of what activities people need to do. And that cycle of replicating ingestion of something or remembering what we did is called the reward pathway. So typically we, we have a response, we like it, we send a signal to the brain and we have a memory for it and we repeat it over and over again. Now back to the uh, alcohol. So once it's been in the brain for about five, 10 minutes, uh, and if people continue to uh, drink the alcohol, they begin to actually slow their cognition down and then eventually slow their coordination down and then on the roller coaster, they have emotional swings. So typically in the very beginning of alcohol consumption, we feel the euphoria, the lightheadedness, the giddiness, but that quickly fades and does not return as you consume more and more alcohol. So the smaller the amount of alcohol, the more robust of an effect you're going to get until you begin to have the more complicating situation of reduced thinking, poor coordination and emotional swings. We talked about this GABA. GABA, as I mentioned, and we'll come back to this again, inhibits the flow of dopamine. So alcohol consumption will affect GABA release. And then glutamate is the fifth chemical that's important. And this one is actually quite serious in the sense that when glutamate begins to build up in the human brain, it's a stimulatory or an excitatory chemical. It actually can lead to um, cravings, it can lead to aggression, and it can lead to seizures. So we want to prevent the buildup of glutamate, but we know that continued alcohol consumption over time, you begin to change the balance of GABA and glutamate in the brain, and you begin to get these chemical changes that are difficult to overcome over time. So back to this picture again, as I mentioned, we initially, uh, the alcohol gets absorbed into the stomach and then into the small intestine. As soon as it hits the stomach, there's plenty of blood vessels that rush the alcohol to the brain. And then the alcohol obviously gets pumped through the body. It goes to the heart, relaxes some of the heart muscle, and then eventually goes to the liver where it's broken down, metabolized, and then excreted in the kidneys. So when we think about the initial ingestion of alcohol, if you think about the absorption from the stomach, really the key thing about alcohol consumption is how long does it take to get the alcohol in your stomach into the bloodstream? So we know that people who have food in their stomach are gonna delay the absorption of alcohol. We know that people who are of certain body types are going to absorb alcohol faster or slower. We know that if the alcohol is diluted in some kind of liquid, we're going to absorb it a little more slowly. We also know that the food that's most likely to inhibit um, absorption of alcohol is fat. And so one of the key things that I have found over the decades that seem to be um, common is our wine and cheese parties, because when you begin to eat the cheese, you have fat in your, in your stomach, you drink the wine, it prevents you from absorbing the wine very quickly, your blood alcohol level doesn't go up very quickly, and you have more of a slow release of the alcohol into the bloodstream, and consequently, you're not stumbling all over the place, uh, falling into your, um, 
your classmates or your professor's lap from consuming too much alcohol. So there is a benefit if someone is going to ingest alcohol of making sure that they have fat in their stomach. I'm not recommending a whole thing of butter, but anything that has fat in it will certainly delay the absorption. So when alcohol is absorbed, it eventually goes to the liver, but initially it's broken down in the stomach by two, by, by an enzyme, a chemical called alcohol dehydrogenase. So the body has a way of breaking alcohol down in two steps. The first step occurs in the liver and the small intestine, and then the second step happens in the liver. The two chemicals that we break alcohol down are listed here. There's alcohol dehydrogenase, which is in the stomach, and then aldehyde dehydrogenase, which is in the liver. These um, enzymes are actually genetically determined. They're are um, different amounts of enzyme depending on your body makeup, your sex, or your, your racial makeup that controls how you break down alcohol. The important thing is that in the stomach, if you can again delay the um, amount of alcohol that's absorbed, the al alcohol dehydrogenase has more of a chance to break the alcohol down and consequently you don't have as much of an elevated blood level. And in some individuals, who absorb alcohol relatively quickly, it then gets broken down in the liver to this aldehyde dehydrogenase. The most common reason in people who consume lots of alcohol for a hangover the following day is the accumulation of this acetaldehyde because as you'll see in a moment, we break alcohol down at a certain rate and that rate cannot be controlled. It is uh, consistent at about 0.15% per hour or seven grams per hour. So if you remember, each of those standard drinks that I showed you had 14 grams of alcohol per drink. So that means essentially if you consume one drink of alcohol and get 14 grams of alcohol in your body, it's gonna take you two hours to break it down. So essentially half a drink per hour is how we metabolize. However, let's say for the sake of argument, you have three drinks in the span of an hour, it's gonna take you six hours to get rid of all the alcohol in your body. And there's nothing that you can do to speed that up. This is genetically determined. And so it's not like you can drink a lot of water, you can drink a lot of coffee. It's nothing but time that allows us to break alcohol down. So really it's a calculation when people consume alcohol, how quickly it gets broken down. 90 to 98% of it gets metabolized in the liver, but we have some that gets metabolized elsewhere, which we'll talk about in a minute. So a couple things to mention here, which may be quite surprising, that women, for the most part, have 20 to 25 to 50% less of the initial alcohol dehydrogenase to break down alcohol. So if a man consumes one drink and a woman consumes one drink, it's going to take the woman twice as long to break the alcohol down as the man. So the recommendations for alcohol intake reflect that. We also know that women, when they are pregnant and they drink, the fetus gets a direct amount of that blood alcohol. So we obviously don't recommend that women consume alcohol because of the effect on the, on the fetus. We also know that there are genetic variations so that that second enzyme I mentioned, that aldehyde dehydrogenase means that um, you cannot eliminate that acetaldehyde. So it's essentially like acetaldehyde is similar to formaldehyde, which is embalming fluid. And the accumulation of acetaldehyde makes people sick, causes them to vomit, have a flushing response. And 50% of people from Asia have this genetic polymorphism where they're just not able to break alcohol down. And so the incidence of alcohol use disorders in many different populations is essentially zero because they just cannot consume alcohol. It's protective. The other very interesting thing about the genetics of alcohol is the following. We know that in uh, children of uh, adults who have alcohol dependency are almost four times increased risk of dependence for a variety of reasons. One of, the, one of the reasons though is a reduced perception that alcohol has affected them. So when they initially drink and they have that euphoric feeling, it takes a while for the effects on their cognition to kick in. So for instance, there was a study done that gave um, uh, males who were 
uh, um, uh, sons of uh, alcohol dependent individuals alcohol and had them walk a straight line. And then they gave same amount of alcohol to individuals who did not have a family history of alcohol use disorder. Um, and they asked them when they thought that they were intoxicated. And the um, first group would not able to tell even when they were staggering or wobbling or swaying that they had uh, ingested enough alcohol. So this delayed perception of alcohol's effects is something that we believe is genetically determined. And so it makes it more risky because again, you don't recognize that you've had too much to drink. You continue to drink until uh, too much has been consumed. We also know that males who have alcohol use disorder have less of that enzyme. So in summary, it really comes down to with less enzyme to break alcohol down, pure alcohol gets into your blood system faster, gets to your brain faster, and takes longer to break down. The other thing, uh, just to go back to, is this business of, uh, of pharmacology of alcohol. So 99% is metabolized, a little bit is left unchanged, and that's why you can do a breathalyzer um, to determine the amount of alcohol in the system, uh, because a little bit does pass through into the, um, into the breath and a slight amount into the urine, we can actually test urine for the presence of alcohol. So the concept of a hangover, again, is this accumulation of acetaldehyde. Um, typically, people will get a headache from dehydration. They'll have stomach upset. They'll feel nauseated. They'll be dizzy. And it can take many hours for this to resolve. One other reason, though, that people tend to have a hangover is that in the production of alcohol, it's not a pure process where 100% of the sugar gets converted to ethanol, some of it does get converted to methanol. So when we consume alcohol, typically we're consuming small amounts of methanol, uh, which is um, uh, harmful to us. And treatment for methanol overdose, someone who ingests methanol, um, is we give people ethyl alcohol. So it has been well studied that if you do have a hangover in the morning, if you take a small thimble full, nothing more than a maybe a tablespoon of alcohol and you ingest that, not enough to get intoxicated, you will metabolize the rest of the methanol in your body and your headache will quickly resolve. I am certainly not advocating that people wake up in the morning and start drinking again, but what I'm saying is that because of methanol consumption, headaches can be helped somewhat by the ingestion of very small amounts of alcohol the next day with resolution of their, um, their severe symptoms. So let's talk a little bit about the concentrations of alcohol and why they matter. So you can see here from this chart that even at 0.2% BAC, 5% of drivers are too intoxicated. Our, in the United States, our limit is set at 0.8, which is where 65% of drivers are too intoxicated because of lack of muscle control and reduced sensation. But in many European countries, 0.04 is the legal limit because at that point, 15% of people are too intoxicated to drive. So you can see even with a small increase from 0.8 to one, which doesn't seem like very much, you have a 35% increase in drivers being too intoxicated, but a, a two-fold increase in the risk of accident. And then when you double that from 0.1 to 0.2, you have an eight-fold increase in the risk of an accident to 65 times normal. Now, these numbers of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0.5, these are for people who are not alcohol tolerant. We do know that there are individuals who, because of their tolerance to alcohol, because of the length of time that they've been drinking, probably for years, can get to these fairly high levels and not appear to be stuporous or in a coma. I have personally um, cared for people at, at the hospital who come in with blood alcohol levels of 0.42 because over time their bodies and their brains have accommodated to these high alcohol levels and they're still functional. They're not in a coma and they're not near death. But acute ingestion in people that are alcohol, relatively alcohol naive will lead to all of these. So let's talk a little bit about the effects on the body uh, uh, from alcohol and whether or not there's a good and a bad. So we're gonna talk about the uh, central nervous system. We're gonna talk about the cardiovascular system. We're gonna talk a little bit about sleep, a little bit about social, and then what about cancer? 
So we do know that when it comes to the heart, small amounts of alcohol actually increase the amount of healthy cholesterol that we have. There's three main kinds of cholesterol. There's low density cholesterol, which is the bad kind. There's high density lipoprotein, which is the good kind. And then there's very low density lipoproteins, which are not so good. And we know that alcohol increases the amount of HDL. And when we talk about low level, we're talking about one alcoholic beverage for a male or a half an alcoholic beverage for a female is considered to be a low level of alcohol. And that increases your lipids and it does reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease, meaning stroke and heart attack. And we think it's because of the effect and wine has the most profound effect than beer than spirits from these polyphenols, which are found um, especially in red wine that have a positive effect uh, on, the, on the cardiovascular system. However, the opposite is true. Heavy drinking can lead to cardiomyopathy, which is an enlarged heart or an abnormal heart rhythm, such as atrial fibrillation. So clearly there's a balance. And you can see in this graph here that when you look at the probability of developing heart disease at light to moderate drinkers, you see a downward trend for cardiovascular disease in both men and women, and then it rises back again for heavy drinkers. And non-drinkers actually have a slightly increased risk of cardiovascular disease compared to light or moderate drinkers. When it comes to the central nervous system, as I mentioned earlier, low levels have a calming effect on people, but then uh, rebound. And there's actually some evidence that low levels, again, one drink for a man, half a drink for a woman, may actually reduce the risk of dementia. There's a great study out of California has been following people for the last 40 years. They're now following people in their 90s, and they find that small levels of alcohol actually have a protective effect on um, people developing dementia. However, we do know that higher levels clearly damage the brain. Uh, alcohol is toxic to the brain cells. It affects the back part of our brain where the cerebellum is. It affects our balance. It has a profound effect on memory. It can damage the nerves, uh, which involve cognition and and thinking, we can see on scans of the brain and people who are, have heavy alcohol use, they have begun to uh, destroy parts of the white matter and the gray matter in the brain. You have loss of volume. Um, and we also know that the nerves in the uh, hands and feet can certainly be affected by um, heavy alcohol use over time. Sleep. A lot of people believe if they take a small amount of alcohol, it will actually help them sleep. Well, it is somewhat sedating. But the interesting thing about alcohol is when it starts to be metabolized, we actually turn it into energy. So alcohol is not a zero sum. It's not like we drink it and nothing happens. We actually produce some fatty acids, which over time can cause people to gain weight. Well, this production of fatty acid actually turns into brain energy. So if you have a, a drink at 10 o'clock at night and you fall asleep at 1030, at one o'clock in the morning, you may be wide awake because the brain is now taking that and, and consuming the energy and you're wide awake. We also know that alcohol can disrupt sleep patterns by affecting a REM sleep and, uh, and cause us to um, not get to the deepest part of sleep, which is stage three sleep. It just gets us to stage one or two. And that deep sleep is very important for our uh, mental health. Uh, alcohol can actually also increase snoring by relaxing the um, skeletal muscles and smooth muscles of the throat and neck so that they become more relaxed and people consequently when they breathe uh, will make more noise because of loosening of the tissues. We also know that if you binge a lot in the evening, you have an increased risk of a, a elevated heart rate and a cardiovascular risk in the morning. On a social level, we obviously are social beings. We use alcohol to share experiences and at low levels, certainly it can be very enjoyable, can relax inhibitions, but clearly at higher levels, we have seen the disruption in the social fabric. We have the social tolerance where people um, uh, gather with others who consume lots of alcohol. There's allowances made for certain ways of acting. You have the issues of enabling of um, alcohol use, you have Codependence, where people actually um, live with someone who is a heavy alcohol user and has high needs, and the needs of that individual are met by the other person. So these are problems that develop in relationships uh, of folks that have uh, alcohol use disorder. And then finally, turning our attention briefly to just the incidence of cancer, light to moderate drinking is associated with a minimally increased risk of overall cancer. We know in 48,000 men followed for 24 years who were non-smokers that the risk of alcohol-related cancers was not increased uh, for up to two drinks per day. 
However, in women, there was a slight increase uh, in 88,000 nurses followed for 30 years who never smoked, mainly breast cancer, slightly increased risk, even in the range of up to one alcoholic drink a day. So it's, um, there, it is a risk uh, for development of cancer, but the risk is slight. There are certainly um, in, in heavy users of alcohol, many different kinds of cancers that can develop uh, in people, but light, very light drinking does not lead to that. So in summary, we know that low dose daily alcohol uh, is better for health uh, than less frequent consumption. So people who drink periodically don't get as much benefit as those who are low dose alcohol users. But binge drinkers, uh, even amongst otherwise light drinkers, increase their cardiovascular events and mortality. So really we're, what I'm saying is you don't need to start drinking to get the benefit from alcohol use. But if you're currently drinking a light or moderate amount, there's no reason to stop. But the reason that we don't recommend that people stop drinking is that there's always a potential for problem drinking. And because we don't really know the makeup of people's brains and what their co-occurring situations are, it's always risky to recommend that people should start drinking. But in those who are drinking, the recommendation is to continue with low dose. So what is at-risk drinking? Well, we know that for men up to the age of 65, no more than four drinks in a day and no more than 14 drinks in a week is at-risk drinking. Um, and for healthy women and healthy men over age 65, no more than three drinks in a day and no more than seven drinks in a week. So in, in each of these cases, four drinks in a day or less uh, would mean that there's only 10 drinks for the rest of the week that one should have. And as you saw earlier, low levels of daily is probably better than high levels periodically in terms of health. So we consider this at risk. When we look at the prevalence of alcohol use disorder, and just for terminology, we no longer use the word alcoholic um, or alcohol addicts. We use the word alcohol use disorder because we believe there's a spectrum and we also believe that it's a medical condition because of the genetics and the, uh, the makeup of the human body that exposure to alcohol can lead to problems, but we do know that, you know, 90% of people have at least consumed alcohol once in their life, about 60% are current drinkers, and only 10 to 20% will meet the criteria for a use disorder. We do know that almost 50% of people will have temporary problems from, for alcohol, and for most people, they're able to get some help and overcome that, and very small number of people, 3 to 10% of the general population actually meets the criteria for alcohol dependence, meaning that um, they, they can't stop drinking without consequences. When we think about how to diagnose a substance use disorder, we typically have these criteria that come from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Psychiatrists use this. It's basically a, taxon uh, a taxonomy of how do we categorize something as a problem or not. And so in this case, you can see that the questions that are being asked have to do with how the alcohol or drug use affects the person in their day-to-day -day activity. I will draw your attention to the bottom two items of tolerance and withdrawal. These are very important because anybody who consumes alcohol or takes opiates over time will develop tolerance to the effects um, because the brain has chemical receptors for these drugs and you need more and more for the same effect. And conversely, when you stop the use of them, you have a withdrawal and the withdrawal can be quite significant. And so for most people, the, the withdrawal is what drives them to continue to use because they don't like the effects of the withdrawal. But when you look at the number of criteria that you need, someone could have tolerance and withdrawal from a, from a controlled substance that's prescribed. They don't necessarily have a problem. Um, but in this case, we categorize as mild, moderate, and severe. So having a certain number of these criteria will help us as docs uh, determine the level of disease. Um, you could say it's like staging cancer. Do you have stage one, two, three, or four? We look at it in the same way and we treat it in the same way. The other way of screening is what's called an audit C. It basically has three questions. How often do you have a drink? How many drinks containing alcohol in a typical day? And how often do you have six or more drinks? And there's a score that we use to identify people who are at risk drinking. I personally, in my practice, like the two most simple questions, which is when was the last time you had a drink of alcohol? And so if you say to me it was last month, if you say to me it was last night, 
I then say, well, how much does it take to get a buzz? Because that gives me an indication of your tolerance. So if someone says, oh, I, I start to feel it on a half, half a drink, then we know that the person really is a light drinker. If someone says it takes me three or four before I really feel it, we know that they have a higher tolerance. So it does help with um, gauging or grading the degree of problem that we're having. So Vermont has a pretty long history in terms of alcohol consumption. As you know, in the 1700s, uh, essentially, we had grain to make beer, and we had apples to make cider. And so these beverages were low potency alcohol, somewhere between five to 7%. Um, they were kept in kegs in, uh, on, in farms, and they were consumed on a regular basis. In the 1840s in Vermont, Vermont at one point was known as the breadbasket of New England. It was a lot of barley, a lot of oats, a lot of wheat, a lot of corn. And what happened is the surplus grain began to be used by farmers on their little stovetop stills and they made distilled alcohol. So the potency went from five to 7% up to 40 or 50%. And consequently, uh, public intoxication was a much bigger problem in the 1840s in Vermont than it was prior to that. Vermont actually had a uh, attempt at um, prohibition in the 1850s and the temperance movement used this uh, guide as a way to really try to keep people from drinking because basically they said from the first glass to the grave, once people start drinking, they increase the amount of consumption and they run into more and more problems over time. So there was a pretty active movement in Vermont they, just before the Civil War to really damp down the amount of alcohol being consumed because of the problems that were occurring. And these DRAN laws came about, which limited um, the amount of alcohol that could be consumed and uh, had liability for tavern owners. Uh, people who served alcohol would theoretically be liable for, but it was really an attempt to try to curb the amount of alcohol that was being served to people in, um, oops, what happened there, in taverns. Interestingly also, town meetings, and I've seen some of these reports, would actually tally the annual storage amounts of beer and uh, cider that they would have to make sure that they had enough on hand for the entire year. So when people began to look at alcohol, most people consider that um, the impaired model is the most common model where you have something wrong with you, you have a, something's wrong, you, you can't stop drinking, um, and yet the least common uh, way of approaching it is through the chronic illness model, which really talks about brain chemistry, brain disease, the dry moral model was uh, the, the war on drugs, where if you just uh, incarcerate people or make it very difficult for them to get substances, they'll stop using, clearly not the case. The wet moral model kind of promoted responsible drinking or responsible drug use, which again can become difficult. And I think what we've really evolving to is a spectrum of understanding that people use drugs and alcohol for so many different reasons and have so many different responses to that. And those responses really require help and assistance um, to try to help people, to people stop. So we've already talked a little bit about tolerance and withdrawal, physiologic dependence. The other key thing uh, as we get into treatment, we're about to get into treatment, is this concept of cross tolerance and cross dependence. So when we talked about alcohol earlier, I mentioned these two chemicals, this glutamate and this GABA, which have this balance in the brain. And what we're really trying to produce is the production of excess glutamate in the brain when people stop drinking, because that can lead to all kinds of problems. And so we can use other drugs to help people withdraw from alcohol while preventing the bad outcomes. This is a graph of what happens when someone stops drinking, this kind of three peaks. And what we really worry about are the first and the third peak, the seizures and the severe withdrawal. And it's mostly predicated on the release of this, again, this chemical glutamate. Glutamate, excess glutamate release will, release will cause people to have a seizure. We don't want that. And in severe cases can cause paranoia and what we call delirium tremens, where people's blood pressure is out of control. They're completely agitated. They hallucinate. They try to jump out of windows, they try to harm people. And many times these folks end up in the intensive care unit um, strapped down to prevent self-harm. So the withdrawal from alcohol in severe cases can actually be uh, fatal. And so we do know that there are individuals who are heavy drinkers who ha either have a history of seizures or a history of DTs. They probably need to be hospitalized to help them stop drinking. While most people 
are in this lower category where once they stop drinking for about three to four days, they're gonna have a variety of symptoms that are gonna be problematic, but certainly not at risk that they need to be hospitalized. So when we think about who needs to be hospitalized, let's say we determine that someone's got severe alcohol use disorder, they can't stop drinking, they've met the criteria based on our evaluations. And now we say, you need to go to treatment. Well, treatment to me really represents medical treatment to start off with. And so we have to determine if the person's gonna need medication to help them stop drinking, or if they're just gonna need a quiet space for a number of days. And when we look at predictors of the severity of alcohol withdrawal, we worry about people over the age of 50. We obviously are concerned if people have blood alcohol levels above 0.25, they've clearly got a lot of alcohol tolerance and they're gonna need to be in a supervised setting. And then if they've had prior seizures or prior DTs, they have to be hospitalized. We also concern about medical issues. We worry about people who've had recent heart attacks, people who have kidney disease, liver disease, breathing problems, recent surgery, all of these require, most likely a person needs to be hospitalized. And about 10 to 20% of patients um, who have severe alcohol use disorder um, will have uh, these situations right here. So we do have to pay attention when we're thinking about the best setting uh, where, where people should end up. So we can put people in the hospital, we can treat them with medication. And basically our friend uh, GABA and glutamate teeter-totter here is what we're working at. And what we're working at is we're giving people medications to increase the amount of GABA and decrease the amount of glutamate. And those chemicals tend to be drugs that prevent people from having seizures. We use something called the CWA protocol, which is a clinical institute of withdrawal from alcohol. And we look at six, seven or eight different areas. And what happens is that a nurse in the hospital will have a checkboard and we'll look at each of these and there'll be a, a graded scale. And so if you get points for each of these, depending on the severity, if you score greater than 10, you're usually given a sedative, usually a benzodiazepine like a, like a Valium or diazepam or something of that sort. And you're continuously assessed every hour and you're continuously dosed with one of these medications if you score greater than 10, because giving people the benzodiazepines, the sedatives will prevent them from having a seizure and prevent them from having DTs and also reduce their agitation and their blood pressure. So the standard treatment for severe alcohol use disorder is the use of benzodiazepines with the scoring mechanism to determine how much the person needs. Once the person's been adequately treated in the hospital, then the real work begins. We've kept the person from having a bad outcome, but then we have to think about, okay, what's next? And I think for a lot of people, we have this, you know, this old terminology of going to rehab. And if you think about the treatment of alcohol use, it really wasn't until the 1930s when uh, two people founded AA, um, which was, we'll get to that in just a little bit. There were really no medications that you could give to anybody to treat alcohol use disorder. So the basic thing is you would go somewhere and you would quote, dry out, you would stop drinking alcohol, you would do some programming, you'd spend some time doing activities, and hopefully you wouldn't return to drink. We know that that generally, for many people, does not work, especially people who have severe alcohol use disorder. So we then have to think about medications to reduce the amount of alcohol that people drink or stop them. So I'd like to just review five or six different medications that are commonly used in, in practice to really help people stop using alcohol. The first one, so uh, again, just a little review, we're, we're again looking at chemicals in the brain and we're really focused on the third and the fifth one here, the GABA and the glutamate. But when we're talking also about treating alcohol use disorder with medication, we're also going to focus on the endorphins and on serotonin. There's really no medication to increase the amount of dopamine. So the first one we're going to talk about is anabuser disulfiram. Maybe many of you have heard about this. This is a medication that if you drink, you vomit. And the reason that this occurs is because anabuse inhibits the enzyme, the second enzyme in the two-step process, the aldehyde dehydrogenase, 
it stops that enzyme from working. So you build up these levels of acetaldehyde and kind of a, a create an acute hangover, but it's a pretty significant effect. So most people who have ever consumed alcohol on an abuse, who vomit, who get flushing, who feel terrible, realize that if they drink again, it's not gonna be pretty. So it's what we call aversive therapy. Uh, people have to take the medication every day. Um, we like to have people completely on board about it. Forcing someone to take antabuse typically doesn't work because people have all kinds of ways of not taking it. But essentially you take it daily and we like to see people be on it for at least three, three months, sometimes six months uh, to really help them uh, break the cycle of alcohol use. And it can be effective. There are certainly side effects from it. I can give you a metallic taste in the mouth. It can sometimes affect your liver enzymes. And there are ways that people can cheat um, the abuse by drinking tiny little amounts of alcohol until they overcome it. But for the most part, it's, a, it's the oldest of all the medications to treat, um, to treat severe alcohol use disorder. The second, actually, the one that has the most evidence and the most efficacious, but again, only about 10 to 15% of the time is it long-term effective, is naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist. So we're giving somebody a medication to block the release of the endorphins and consequently reduce the reward when people drink. It's a once a month injection. Um, people who get it uh, typically will start taking the oral form for a few days to make sure they tolerate it. And then every 28 days, they'll get an injection. The key thing about naltrexone is that it will reduce the frequency that people drink and reduce the amount that people drink, but will not stop people from drinking. So in folks that have difficulty with the euphoria that gets created when they drink alcohol, this can be an effective strategy. And if it's combined with regular visits to a physician or a, a healthcare provider, it can actually make a big difference in helping people stop. I have patients who've been on naltrexone now three or four years, they get the shot once a month. The one thing to know is that people should have a little medical alert bracelet just to make sure that they don't um, get opioids if they get injured. The other medication that's FDA approved is a campersate. It works by helping cravings. We have a couple other seizure drugs that we can use to paramate, which is Topamax and Gabapentin, which is Neurontin. They're both investigational, but there's good evidence for both of them to help reduce drinking. Um, and then we have the non medication uh, aspects. We have AA, which is based on a self-help program and a helper therapy principle. Um, one thing that was studied over 10 years in the project MATCH, it looked at standard outpatient therapies. And if you look at the dotted line that corresponds to 001, that was the one activity that showed the highest level of abstinence from alcohol. And that essentially was having people help other people in their day-to-day -day lives by giving back. And that was shown, has been shown over a 10 year period to be the most effective way for people to actually stop drinking. So it's this helper helping others principle that is really at the core. There's also something called smart recovery, which is self-management and recovery training. And then rational recovery, another uh, self-help group, uh, self-help program. And then lastly, remember that adults with any kind of a substance use disorder were almost three times as likely to have a serious mental illness. We know that from many studies, trauma is so common in people with alcohol use disorder and other substance use disorders. So we have to make sure that we're also, once people have stopped the alcohol use, that we also treat their underlying uh, psychiatric condition if, if present. And then we also know that people who were duly diagnosed are at increased risk of relapse, hospitalization, homelessness, infections, being in jail, family stress, violence, and suicide. So local resources, um, we have many in town. Uh, Denise at the end is going to give a list of the Howard Center programs uh, that are uh, available to people in the community. Um, but they're also very, very important in terms of people's overall recovery. Lastly, remember that this concept of prohibition just didn't work. Uh, we in this country passed a law inhibiting or pro prohibiting the ingestion of alcohol. The desire for creatures to consume alcohol was too great and it was eventually repealed. It's the only amendment we've ever repealed. 
And so the desire to drink remains, it's just a question of how do we manage it and how do we modify it to prevent harm. So um, I'm gonna take some questions now. I see there's some in the chat box. Let's see if I've answered any of them. And uh, if so, we'll move on to the next. So let me see what I got here. So the first question asks about are certain concentration levels of alcohol or forms uh, worse than others? The answer is no, alcohol is alcohol. The human brain doesn't really care if it's whiskey or beer, but it's the volume, obviously. You can drink a lot of whiskey in a short period of time. It's hard to drink a lot of beer in a short period of time. So if you're consuming you know, a large amount of, um, of higher potency alcohol, certainly you're gonna have more problems uh, more quickly by getting those blood alcohol levels up. Uh, the question about the COVID-19 pandemic, long-term effect on the rate of alcohol consumption. Well, it's interesting. We do know that um, at least in Vermont, our uh, tax uh, revenue from alcohol went way up during the COVID. Um, we do know that um, isolation and, uh, and all the things that have come with it have certainly uh, increased the amount of alcohol and drug. We've had more fatal drug overdoses in 2020 than we've had in previous years. It's what we call a twin epidemic. Um, I think always there's going to be uh, individuals who perhaps would not have consumed alcohol during the pandemic who, because of isolation or being uh, depressed, loss of job, began to drink. And it certainly could be a lifelong affliction for them. And it was probably magnified by um, by having to deal with uh, such a severe, severe event. <clears throat> so the line drawn between um, being dependent on alcohol and enjoying it on a regular basis, I think I've answered that question. Um, and you know, like I say, small amounts of alcohol on a daily basis are probably he healthy and protective. And it's all a question of you know what are the behaviors, what are the things that happen when when people consume alcohol. So. Um, I would say when you, the question is uh, about whether or not to be concerned or not, it's a fine line. And I would say that if someone's, if a woman's drinking more than two drinks or a man's drinking more than three drinks, uh, more than three drinks on a regular basis, that yeah, they're, they're drinking at higher levels. And certainly levels much higher than that obviously is a, is a cause for concern. Um, we did talk about the red wine, good for the heart. It does have positive effects because of the polyphenols. Um, this is a question about college kids dying from alcohol consumption at frat parties. Um, it does, uh, so the question is, does it reflect an actual increase in fatalities from alcohol or just increased media attention? I think that it's increased attention to a problem that's been present for decades and has gone unrecognized. Also because of, um, <clears throat> you know, more concern about hazing and, uh, and things of that sort, there's much greater uh, concern about whether or not some of these were due to, um, to bullying events. But um, certainly uh, we, know, we have some thinking that, in fact, at Middlebury College a few years ago had this idea that, you know, if you came to college, perhaps we could help you learn to drink responsibly so that you didn't have to hide it and you didn't have to binge. And, um, that never went anywhere because the drinking age was still 21. But this concept of, you know, what is responsible drinking? How does one learn responsible drinking is an ongoing debate. And I don't have a great answer for you. Um, this question about underage kids tasting the alcoholic beverages, even to give them a full can of beer once in a while. Um, yes, it certainly does present a risk for developing a dependency, especially in uh, families with family history of uh, alcohol or drug use. Because of the genetics of it, I would be very careful. I think it's difficult having had, you know, three kids of my own and having been a, a kid once myself. I think it's difficult once you start to consume alcohol and enjoy the feeling of it to not want to have it over and over again. So it is hard to prevent uh, people from alcohol. Um, and so it's, again, it's a personal family matter, but I have certainly seen the untoward bad effects from families that you know, regularly consume alcohol. And unfortunately over decades of taking care of families with substance use disorder, most kids started very young with their family or with their friends. And so delaying the onset, at least until people are close to being 17 or 18 is much better for the developing brain. And certainly 21 is even better because our brains aren't fully developed until we're like 26 years old and all that executive functioning 
is just not happening until you know people reach their early 20s. Does meditation release dopamine? The answer is yes. Um, and so uh, we talk about alcohol expectations. Yes, clearly there's a set and setting and the, the drug, the set and the setting, those three uh, components of consumption play a huge role in it. If you, know, you light some candles and you have uh, a darkened room and you have a, a glass, uh, some alcohol, you're certainly gonna be in a better mood. Um, then if you're, you know, driving down the street and all of a sudden you come upon a raging fire or something of that sort, that's just going to create a lot of, uh, a lot of adrenaline. So, um, we also know that from placebo effects, if you gave someone, if you told someone you were giving them alcohol, um, and you gave them something that had the taste of alcohol, but no alcohol in it, they could actually exhibit some signs of feeling euphoric although it won't last very long, but clearly that has something to do with it. Um, so how could people get drunk at a different rate based on gender? But so, so people, yes. So the issue is this, the, break, the, the breakdown of alcohol at the rate of one drink per hour, ha, that's the end result. The, what I was trying to convey to you is that if, I drink the same amount as a woman, that person, the woman's gonna have twice the blood alcohol level that I'm going to have because she has only half the enzyme to break the alcohol down. So let's say I have one drink and I reach a BAC of 0.03 and she has one drink and she reaches a BAC of 0.06. It's gonna take me two hours to have the alcohol out of my body, but four hours for her to have the alcohol out of her body. So this idea of breaking it down is after the blood alcohol level has already been achieved. So anything we can do to reduce the initial blood alcohol level keeps us from having to break it down that much more. Yes, number five, glutamate is the fifth neurotransmitter involved uh, when you've got endorphin, serotonin, dopamine, and GABA, correct. How often should I drink red wine if I want to improve my heart health, but I want, don't want to cause damage to anything else? Well, um, that's a really good question. I um, would say that based on the evidence, um, and again, I'm, a, I'm going to say that if you're a man, it's uh, less than two. And if you're a woman, it's less than one. If you have a low level of red wine on a regular basis, it certainly could potentially make a difference. So small amounts, so let's say three ounces, four ounces of red wine um, for a man and two ounces of red wine for a woman would probably be a fair amount for someone to consume for heart health. Why does someone recovering from alcohol use disorder continue to have a weakened immune system? Uh, I don't know if that is true. Um, we do know that um, in some individuals, uh, Alcohol, and I didn't mention all the effects that alcohol have on the human body. Alcohol certainly affects the liver, can affect the pancreas, and it can affect people's uh, bone marrow, can suppress bone marrow. Um, so once people have done the damage from alcohol to the liver, the liver can recover to a certain extent. Uh, the pancreas uh, will often be scarred for the rest of one's life, and the bone marrow can be suppressed in some cases permanently. So um, that's the problem is that if you have done irreversible damage, you're gonna have some difficulty. The American Society for Clinical Oncology reported that alcohol is the third leading cause of cancers. <clears throat> um, and when studies of large population take non-drinkers into account, any apparent cardiovascular benefits of moderate drinking disappear. Yes, this is an, an ongoing discussion. There are no, I've looked at, many large cohort studies in Europe and the United States, the evidence is still not conclusive. You know, some years red, oh, uh, alcohol is good and some years alcohol is not. Um, and I think the problem is that every time a new study comes out, people want to take that on, on faith. Um, and again, we talk about moderate drinking, you're talking at least two or three drinks a day as opposed to the light amount that I was talking about. So really it's a, it's a question of, um, of degree. And um, it may be that you know, 20, 30 years from now, more evidence comes out. 
Uh, so let's see, what are we doing on time? I want to leave enough time for Denise, okay, to clarify. In terms of alcohol amount ingested and potential health benefits, is there a difference if a person on average is a light drinker, if someone drinks two to four drinks and other nights doesn't drink at all? Yes. So what I was trying to point out is if you're consuming above two uh, and you're drinking, let's say four, the effects of binge drinking are less um, healthy than light drinking a small amount every day. So like I was saying, a small amount um, is much better than to drink a larger amount two or three days a week because that amount of alcohol, you're taking a hit to the system, you're causing the body to have to work overtime. And it's just that much more of, a, of an alcohol load that has to be metabolized. Because remember, if you drink a small amount of alcohol, you're gonna metabolize that within an hour or two, it's gonna be gone. But if you drink four drinks, it could take you theoretically eight hours to break all that alcohol down. So your body's just being exposed to it for that much longer period of time. What accounts for the genetic differences related to alcohol metabolism? Uh, let's see, so accounts for the culture. I mean, it's just the way that we're wired. We, I don't know the answer to you know why some people have the gene and why some people don't. Um, but clearly we know that those differences exist. It would be nice if we could screen people at very young ages for what their risk for alcohol and drug use is, and perhaps someday we'll be able to do that. Um, but at the present time, there's no way. We just know that there are groups that clearly can't drink because of uh, the inherited genetics. How common is alcohol dependency? So as I mentioned in one of the slides, somewhere between um, 10 to 20 percent of people can have uh, alcohol dependency, and three to 10% of those individuals need uh, significant treatment. Um, how does it compare to other drugs? Well, if you look in the United States at admissions for uh, substance use, it actually turns out that cannabis is the number one reason why people end up going into substance use treatment. In Vermont, we used to say, this was back 20, 30 years ago before opiates was such a problem, that opiate abuse Opioid use is but a tributary in a sea of alcohol abuse. But we now know that in Vermont, opioid use has far surpassed admissions for alcohol use in the state. So we have these, um, these phases in our uh, lives. An interesting uh, historical piece, and then I think I'm gonna be close to ending on this, is that in 1840, 1850, when alcohol use was raging in Vermont, the Civil War in 1860 made morphine widely available to the general population through the Civil War, through soldiers being exposed, and then it just a lot of medicine suddenly had morphine. And so a lot of the farmers, a lot of the people that were making grain alcohol, who were showing signs of public intoxication, switched to morphine and had bottles of morphine elixir that they could take a little pulls on throughout the course of the day and not show signs of intoxication publicly, but clearly would feel the euphoria from it. So that was a significant problem in Vermont from the 1870s until about 1910 was opioid use disorder really overcame in many ways alcohol use disorder. And then with the suppression of opioids through a lot of laws in the uh, 1910, 1920, and then the suppression of alcohol, it's kind of waxed and waned. So there's always this fluctuation also depending on how, how the economy is doing um, in terms of what drugs are used, when when people are having downturns in the in the economic situation, it's usually opioids and alcohol, and then when there's an upturn, it tends to be stimulants such as cocaine. So it really does uh, fluctuate. Uh, why do people have to seek separate services in addiction or mental health, but not both together? Uh, people can access um, was. Um, <clears throat> Equal access does occur in many places. I, I know some places in the United States, there is a separation of the two, but um, you often can get um, services for both, uh, depending on, on the setting that you're in. Uh, sound like Dr. Boo is saying prohibition did not re reduce alcohol use. Prohibition did reduce alcohol use, but people still continue to drink during prohibition. In fact, there was some nuances when I, I did my research that showed that there were certain situations where you could still consume alcohol. A doctor could actually write you a prescription for alcohol that you could use. But um, what, and then we had um, different uh, groups were making uh, beer and wine at home. They had bathtub gin. So my point was that prohibition, while it did suppress alcohol use on a general basis, did not eliminate alcohol use. Um, in the United States. And so we do know that 
even though people's um, desire to drink was reduced during the prohibition, uh, it didn't take away the desire to drink. And then let's see, I'm just gonna answer one last question here. Uh, does consuming alcohol with sugary mixes more negatively impact our overall health impact versus alcohol straighter with water? So like for instance, let's take a rum and Coke. Yes, you're consuming the sugary um, liquid. Um, however, carbonation does increase the absorption of alcohol. So when you're gonna have a drink, you should probably have it with a non-carbonated beverage to actually reduce the absorption of it. Um, and that way you won't have as rapid um, intake into your, um, into your system. So theoretically diluting it with water is gonna reduce the amount of overall alcohol you're gonna absorb at one time. Okay, so Denise, I'm gonna hand it over to you. It's um, got a few minutes left and I, I wanna give you time to, uh, to wrap things up. John, as always, thank you very, very much. You're always so informative, appreciate it. I hope you'll come back sooner than five years. Thank you. Um, and here's the applause. It's, it's so hard because we don't have the energy of everyone, but uh, hopefully very soon again. So we do have up on the screen, if you need help or someone you know needs help, um, please contact our, our main number, 488-6000. Uh, we offer a range of services from short-term uh, detox to long-term uh, recovery supports and uh, offer these in Chittenden and Franklin, Grand Isle counties. Um, individual and group outpatient counseling and case management. We also have an impaired driver rehab program serving individuals who have uh, impaired driving offenses. So um, we have a full range and certainly if you're ever in a critical need and have a, uh, need something um, more quickly, our first call for Chittenden County at 488-7777 is available 24-7. So really appreciate all of our viewers at home. Thank you very much for tuning in. We have one more session that, that we mentioned earlier on April 6th. Uh, we will send you a, an email with a feedback um, survey tomorrow. Hopefully you'll send that in and make some suggestions for our fall series in terms of topics and uh, presenters. And thank you very much. Thank you, John. Be well. Thank you very much and have a good evening, everyone. Good night.